Um, good morning, everyone. So, yeah, as uh, Chris mentioned, my name is Simon Janonka, and I, I focus on breast cancer and immunotherapies, and I'll kind of go into a bit of detail about those things. Um, and there'll be a tiny bit of microscopy, actually, in my talk, even though we're looking at other aspects of research. So why do I still focus on breast cancer when um, a lot of people think that it's... Um, not cured, but um, there's a lot of treatments and people do very well with breast cancer compared to other types of cancer. But breast cancer is like the most common breast can sorry, the best can ah, most common cancer in women, and eight women still die every day of breast cancer in Australia. And this includes actually my aunt who passed away a couple of years ago after a very long fight with breast cancer. And so she had breast cancer for about 15, um, 20 years before she passed away. And for the first 10, 15 years of her life, that was actually not, sorry, of the cancer, it was not too bad. The treatments worked quite well. But when it came back, it had spread throughout her body. And once breast cancer spreads through your body, there's currently not many therapies which work um, for any extended period of time. And so she went through a series of um, therapies and gradually got worse and worse. Um, and despite, as we heard, immunotherapies revolutionizing um, cancer treatment, right now they're not working that well. The current ones are not working that well for breast cancer. Now, just to give you an example of what immunotherapies have done in other types of cancer, um, this is an example of um, Jared Roughhead. He's an AFL player for um, Hawthorne. And he was diagnosed with melanoma in 2015. A year later, he came back with melanoma spread throughout his body. And normally that would be a death sentence. Like a few years back before immunotherapy, people would live for maybe a year or two after being diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. But remarkably, he was putting, put on an immunotherapy trial, and less than a year later, he was declared cancer-free and could return to the field and start playing again. And he's actually only just going to be retiring at the end of the season this year. So because of this, the people who actually came up with the initial discoveries which led to immunotherapies, were well, they were given the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2018. And this is James Allison and um, Tasuku Honju. Now their discoveries actually occurred in the mid to late 90s. Um, and they utilized mouse models to understand how the immune system could be utilized to fight cancer. And in this example of a... Um, so mice were given some um, cancer cells, and then after a period of time, they were given immunotherapy. And the ones given a specific immunotherapy, the tumors just disappeared and went away completely. And this was a very remarkable result. And this is what has led to similar results, um, which are now seen in patients. So how do immunotherapies work? Within your body, you've got a type of immune cell called a T cell. And the T cells have the ability to recognize cancer cells and kill them. However, cancer cells also have the ability to produce a protein, such as PDL1, which can put the T cells to sleep. So this inhibits their ability to fight and kill the cancer cells. But the immunotherapy drugs block this pathway and allow then the T cell to attack the cancer cell and destroy it. Now I'll just give you a quick background to how I got to where I am right now, working on breast cancer in the immune system. So I started off at the ANU and did my undergraduate there, with a focus actually on virology rather than um, cancer. However, when I finished my undergraduate, I drove up the M5 and actually worked at the Garvin on breast cancer for a year actually on a project which um, was in collaboration with something that Chris Goodnow is doing at the ANU. But after a year, now I was actually born in England and I grew up there until I was 10 and I hadn't returned and I thought I'd like to go back and see some of my family there and so I spent a year back in England working in London at a place called Retroscreen Virology. So there I was working on influ influenza virus vaccines and also on antiviral drugs. But the dull weather in England didn't really suit me. I liked the outdoors lifestyle. So I returned to Australia. And initially, I was working actually just around the corner at St. Vincent's Hospital at the Centre for Applied Medical Research, which at the time was actually called the CFI. And there I worked on a project which was looking at how prostate cancer interacted with certain immune cells. 
Now, at that time, I also met my now wife, and she was just about to head to the States. So I hopped on a plane again and went over to um, the University of California, San Francisco. Now, San Francisco is a hub of biomedical research. And so not only is UCSF there, there's also, um, it's close to Berkeley, Stanford, and um, a whole heap of um, biomedical research and industry. And so while there, I worked in the lab of one of the world leaders looking at how inflammation can actually drive cancer. That is, that some of the immune cells in your body actually help the cancers to grow. And this was a really um, inspiring time for me in terms of research. And so when we came back to Australia, I decided to pursue a PhD when I came to the Garvin. And at that time, I focused on um, breast cancer and wanted to understand breast cancer better. But following my PhD, where I gained a great understanding of how breast cancer works and the different varieties of breast cancer there are, it's not a single disease, there's many subtypes, an opportunity arose within the Garvin to join the bone division and utilize my expertise in breast cancer and the immune system and combine that with expertises of other people within the Garvin and St. Vincent's precinct, including um, the team was led by Mike Rogers in the bone division and then there was other people, including um, pathologists, um, immunologists, and other people on this project. And we were actually wanting to know why breast cancer patients who were being treated with osteoporosis drugs actually lived longer. Um, at this time, I also met some great colleagues like Bob here, who were always reminding me to wear my safety glasses. <laughs> now, to treat osteoporosis, for a long time, we've used these drugs called um, bisphosphonates. Now, bisphosphonates have this interesting characteristic, is that they very readily um, stick to bone. So after being injected into your body, they will go straight to the bone and stick to the bone. And this is an autoradiograph of a radio-labeled bisphosphonate, which was injected into a rat. And you can see that it's, after an hour, it was all stuck to the skeleton, or was actually getting um, excreted by the kidneys. Now, there's a certain type of bone cell which degrades the bone. And normally, your body has cells which produce bone and degrade bone. And your skeleton actually gets regenerated every 10 years through this process, and it keeps it healthy and strong. But with osteoporosis, the bone degrading cell becomes overactive. And the bisphosphonate drugs basically get taken up by these um, bone degrading cells and poison them. And this prevents, helps prevent osteoporosis. But how would this act outside of the um, bone and in the actual breast cancers? So here's a bit of microscopy for you. But this is very fancy micros mi microscopy, which was driven actually by a tree fan in the immunology department. But if we inject a fluorescently labeled bisphosphonate, which is red, into a mouse which doesn't have a tumor, you can see that the bisphosphonate goes through the blood vessels, which is the little flash of red you saw, the green is marking macrophages in the um, tissue, um, but then it just disappears. And this is kind of what we'd expect based on its um, bone homing ability. However, when we injected it into a mouse which had a breast tumor, the abnormal blood vessels, the bisphosphonate leaks out, which is what you see, that explosion of red. It just goes out of the blood vessel, and then it's stuck to these little structures within the tumor, which we later established were microcalcifications. Now, microcalcifications is actually one thing that's um, seen when you look at um, mammographic density when you get a scan of your breast, looking for breast cancers. And so this wasn't just a quirk of um, mouse models of breast cancer. When we talked to a nuclear radiologist at um, St. Vincent's Hospital, they said that they actually, they use a radio-labeled bisphosphonate drug to look for where um, breast cancer cells are um, growing in the bone, and they can identify sites where um, they are growing using this technology. But they also saw it light up the actual breast as well in some patients. And in this case, we took a sample from this patient and looked within the um, breast cancer, and we could find these macrophages localizing to the, near the microcalcifications. And basically what we'd seen in the mouse model is that the macrophages would take up these microcalcifications covered in the bisphosphonate drug, and this is the, effect, the way that the bisphosphonate drugs could influence tumor growth in breast cancer. 
Now, as this project was winding up, uh, immunotherapies were really becoming coming to the forefront. So initially, they were just used in melanoma, but as um, Chris mentioned, they started to be used in um, lung cancer, bladder cancer, and a number of other types of cancer. But all these tr um, approvals of the drugs and the trials that led to these were showing that they, these drugs were not working so well in breast cancer patients. And when they did have an effect in breast cancer patients, they seemed to develop resistance quite quickly. Um, here's a quick schematic of um, what a tumour actually kind of looks like. It's a mixture of cells. It's not just the cancer cells. There's immune cells present and the blood vessel cells and other um, cells of your body there. And even the cancer cells, they vary. Like some cancer cells are more likely to be able to spread through the body, other cells are more likely to grow in one spot, and so they have different characteristics. And so I initiated a project to look at what makes different cancer cells behave differently to immunotherapies. And we used this um, process called DNA barcoding. And in a way, we put a DNA barcode into each cancer cell. Sorry, I don't know why that did that. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so we put a DNA barcode into each cancer cell, and then we can track how they respond to immunotherapy or not. And we don't use a, D um, a barcode scanner to look at these barcodes, but actually a DNA sequencer. So what I showed was that when these cancer cells metastasized to the lung, actually in a mouse model, the T cells could... Um, that can recognize it, when you gave them the immunotherapy, the T cells would recognize some of the cancer cells, but there'd be other, other cancer cells which were distinct and could be measured by their barcode they contained, which were completely untouched and were completely resistant. So then now we went to this new Garvin Wiseman Center for Cellular Genomics, which you might hear a bit more about today, and it's full of the latest technology for analyzing cell tissue at very high resolution. So we can use technology in this institute to look at each individual cell, including each cancer cell, but also each immune cell, and understand what communication and what's going on between them. And this process is often described as comparing smoothies versus fruit salad. So for many years, what we've done is we've mushed up all the cells within the tumour and analyze them in very great detail, but as a smoothie. And so you don't really know whether the signal is coming from the immune cell or the cancer cell, but you get a kind of general um, idea of what's going on across the whole tumor. In contrast to that, we've for a long time been able to analyze cells like a fruit salad, but only been able to determine, like to differentiate a blueberry from a strawberry from a pineapple, but not being able to know the same level of detail as what we could generate from the smoothie. But the new Centre for Cellular Genomics allows us to understand the same level of detail, basically understand all the information that's in each individual cell and what drives that cell to be like it is um, at very high resolution. And the way this data looks is that each cell within a tumour here is a little dot, and that dot has a lot of information behind it. And basically, the closer the dots cluster, that means the more similar the cells are. So we can look at the cancer cells, the T cells, and the macrophages, and see what's going on in each and every one of them, and how they communicate. And we'll use this technology to understand what makes one cancer cell different to another, and understand which ones are immune to, or can um, evade the immune system, and which ones can't. Interestingly, when we did this study, we also found this small population of cells within a breast cancer, which were actually osteoclasts. So this takes me back to my work on bone. Um, and although it's been described that these can be present in um, patient breast cancer samples, no one has any idea what osteoclasts are actually doing in a breast tumor. And as a wider larger group, we're expanding these kind of studies and we're actually looking at patient samples. And this is 140,000 cells from 25 different patients, um, breast cancer patients. And we're using this information to try and understand breast cancer specific pathways which can be targeted with immunotherapies. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my mentor, Alex Swarbrick, 
um, the rest of the team, Mike Rogers, and the funding bodies for this research. Thank you.